Okay, so we've talked a lot now about how fish move through the water, the different fins they have, how they use those fins to generate thrust, uh, how they overcome various forms of drag, how they generate lift to combat gravity. Now what let's do is let's take some of those concepts and layer them onto the phylogeny of fishes and thereby also talk to you about the diversity of fishes. Okay, so again, we're starting with uh, extant vertebrate diversity here, where about, although everything is evolutionarily or phylogenetically a fish, uh, from a colloquial or traditional perspective, about half of all vertebrate diversity in terms of species is in the fishes. I'm going to show this form of the phylogeny, and I'm going to expand various components of it as we move up uh, through the phylogenetic tree. So for example, right now you see there's this big bar called nathostomata. Later, we're gonna expand that bar and look at the diversity within it. Nathostomata here means jawed mouth. These are fishes with jaws. So these other two groups here, which we call fishes, myxinoidea, which is a craniate, and then uh, petromyzontoidea, which is the first true vertebrate. Those do not have jaws and are so-called agnathins, that is without jaws. Uh, Myxinoidea, super cool fish, called the hagfish. There are multiple species, 43 species, uh, and they're found in marine environments, temperate marine environments, normally on the benthos. Now, uh, they don't have vertebrae, as we described previously. They also don't have paired fins. Now, the reason why I'm explicitly mentioning this is that the evolution of paired fins is going to be something that is a uh, synapomorphy or synapomorphy uh, for some of the later groups, the evolution of paired fins. These are our paired fins, right? Our pectoral fins and our uh, pelvic fins here. They also don't have a jaw, as I said, and a few other weird features like sort of uh, rudimentary eyes. Their eyes aren't very good. And they also have a series of accessory hearts for helping to move blood around in the system. Uh, and here's a schematic of the inside of a hagfish here, where you see the notochord, which is retained in the adult form rather than vertebral column. They're scavengers, but because they don't have a jaw and because they don't have arms or fins, they have to use a special technique to be able to um, break food off. So you imagine like if you're taking a, uh, a piece of meat, for example, and you want to tear off a chunk. Well, you hold it one hand, you grab it with your teeth, and you rip it like this. Well, they can't, hagfish can't do that, of course. Moreover, they can't move their jaws, their teeth back and forth like this because they don't have jaws. So they don't have leverage in order to pull something off. Now, the way in which they solve this is that they actually grab onto something like a dead whale on the bottom. They grab onto a chunk of it with their mouth. Then they tie a knot in the body and move that knot down their body till they get to the head. And then the head can pull against the knot and rip off a piece of meat. So very cool, knot tying. So I've um, sampled uh, hagfish off the coast of British Columbia and you bring up a big bucket full of hagfish and you reach in and it's just this masses of gelatinous slime. It's the most incredible stuff. And they produce it almost instantly. There can be a hagfish in a tank. You can put your hand in and grab it and poof, the whole tank is full of mucus. It's really quite incredible. And so if you watch this, this is basically they put a bait down on the bottom of the ocean and there's a hagfish there that's munching on the bait. Shark is coming along and the shark is going to try to eat it. You'll see the shark turn and grab it and then quickly spit it out. And you see all that stuff in the mouth of the shark, which is the slime that the hagfish has instantly produced, which is thought to be there for a predator deterrent. Now you see another example here is another shark biting the hagfish and then immediately letting go because its mouth is just really quickly filled with this gelatinous slime. And there's a really cool videos uh, online where uh, people were transporting a hagfish by car and the car got an accident the whole car was full of hagfish slime. When I was a kid, I had an eel skin wallet, which is really a hagfish skin wallet. And every time I gave this lecture, I would say, I reminisce about my old hagfish wallet. Well, I recently bought one uh, because I just wanted to ha have one again. And you can see it on Amazon or whatever. It's called an eel skin wallet, but it's hagfish. Lots of cool stuff about hagfish, but we're going to have to call it there because we've got to move on to the lampreys, Petromyzontoidea. Roughly the same number of species as hagfish, 41. Uh, and now they have vertebrae. Uh, they have beginnings of vertebrae in adult form, uh, as well as, of course, the cranium. Now, these guys aren't found only in the marine environment like hagfishes are. They can either be freshwater only, 
or anadromous. Anadromous means they're born in fresh water, hatched in fresh water, they go out to the ocean, spend the time feeding in the ocean, and they come back into fresh water for reproduction. In the introductory video, uh, you saw the juvenile uh, freshwater form of, hag of lampreys at our cabin in British Columbia, and it's called an amacete, and you see it in the upper right there. Uh, that's the larval amacete form, which is a filter feeder in mud in fresh water, uh, and then it metamorphoses and transitions to an adult form, which is parasitic on other fishes with this nasty oral disc in which they rasp a hole in the side of the fish, uh, and suck the juices out of the fish and then the fish will usually die. And this is thought to be one of the major reasons for the decline of lake trout and other fishes within the Great Lakes is that when they built the St. Lawrence Seaway that allowed ships to come into the Great Lakes, it basically brought uh, sea lampreys in with it, which then uh, became a major problem within the Great Lakes. If you watch the adult spawning, uh, it's kind of cool to watch. So they have that oral disc and they can use it to grab onto each other or onto rocks and then use flexions of their body to move the rock out of the way. So watch this here. He moves it out of the little nest. It's like a little salmon nest that we saw in the introductory video. Lampreys do exactly the same thing. They swim back up from the ocean over those waterfalls just like the salmon and then they spawn in fresh water. Of course we're talking about the anadromous lampreys. The freshwater lampreys still spawn in this manner as well even though they're not migratory. Uh, and so here's some more video of them moving around and, and you can see the gills on the side there. Um, and then here they are actually spawning where the females are releasing eggs and the males are releasing uh, milt or sperm. Okay, so that's it for the agnathans or jawless fishes. And now we're going to go into this other branch on the right here, the nathostomata, and we're going to expand that branch to look at some of the evolutionary splits within that. So here you have as uh, synapomorphies or synapomorphies, you have jaws. So everything here has a jaw now. And they have these paired pectoral and pelvic fins with girdles. So girdles are the bony structures uh, that basically provide support for the pectoral fins or the pelvic fins. So they're our um, shoulders and our pelvis. Okay, so let's take that one bar and just look only at it, but let's expand it and look at the internal splits within it. Now I've drawn red arrows here to correspond to the different groups that I want to talk about in the rest of these fishy lectures. And so I'll often call those the terminal taxa. They just mean the taxa that have made it to the end, to the present. And so those are the ones that we're going to concentrate on for the rest of the, of the lectures. Okay, so now the first major split within the nathostomes is that between chondrichthys and osteichthys. Chondrichthys are the cartilaginous fishes. Their skeleton is entirely cartilaginous. And osteichthys, which are the bony fishes in which they have ossified elements in their skeleton. Okay, so let's first look at chondrichthys. And you can see within these cartilaginous fishes, we're going to talk about four, four groups. The things that's shared by everything on this branch, including a particular type of scale called placoid scales, which I showed you earlier and which you can see again there. None of these have a swim bladder or a lung. They also don't have fin rays. Fin rays are the cartilaginous elements that go into the fin that if you spread a salmon fin, you can see the, the little rays that are coming uh, through the fin. Uh, and they have this cartilaginous skeleton, as I mentioned previously. So let's go through each of these different groups. Uh, holocephali are the rat fishes. It's just a cool, weird group. Uh, 31 species. They're also called chimera. Um, they're found in marine and benthic environments. They can often be deep, but not always. And so in fact, uh, I took those two pictures there uh, off a dock in, near Seattle while scuba diving. And so they can come in relatively shallow, but they are benthically oriented. They have this long rat-like tail, which is why they've been called rat fishes. Um, there's a couple other features of these uh, rat fishes or chimera, and that is that they usually crush mollusks, that crush mollusks and crustaceans with what are referred to as pavement-like teeth. They have this upper jaw that's fused to the cranium, so it's basically this one solid structure for the upper jaw and the cranium. And they only have one gill opening on either side. Before I gave this lecture last year, I happened to be visiting the Beattie Museum, Beattie Biodiversity Museum at the University of British Columbia, and we were looking at the pictures we went along, and I went like, oh, look, a ratfish. And I was like, oh, wait, hey, that looks like my picture. And then I looked at it closely, and I saw my name there, and I was like, oh, it is my picture. <laughs> the next major group 
within the chondrichthys, cartilaginous fishes that I want to talk about, uh, is Galeomorpha. And this is one of the two major shark groups. There's 269 species of these, and these include many of these sort of classic shark species that you might have thought about. The lower left is a, a lemon shark picture that I took uh, in Australia. They tend to be pelagic and carnivorous, but they also include these massive, largest fish on, on planet Earth, uh, planktivorous fishes, these filter-feeding planktivorous fishes like the whale shark, uh, which is the world's largest fish, uh, 18 meters long. And when I gave this lecture in person, I would take a meter tape out in the lecture hall of the Red Path Museum, take it up to one end of the lecture hall and have a student hang on to it, and then spread it across the lecture hall up to the other end to see what 18 meters looked like. And you basically could not fit a large whale shark in the Red Path Museum auditorium straight. You would have to bow it like this in the middle of the auditorium. So Galeomorpha include a lot of these cool things here, just some more pictures of them. Uh, you have whale shark in the upper left, these huge fish, hammerhead shark, um, that picture is from Galapagos, taken by my brother many years ago. Many sharks are highly endangered uh, owing to harvesting, including for fins, so they just cut off the fins and throw them away. But there are increasing numbers of conservation policies put in place to protect them. So this is a picture I took in Galapagos of a fisherman who had uh, set out nets for uh, the day and was very scrupulously and carefully removing a bunch of uh, juvenile black tip reef sharks from the net. This group includes, these, of course, the most famous shark of all, the, uh, the great white shark. Um, and great white sharks are super amazing. My favorite thing about them, of course, is that they're known to leap out of the water after seals, particularly in South Africa. If you look carefully as a shark comes out, look, the seal is actually attached to a string. So what they're doing here is they're towing them. There's, you can see the string there as well. They're towing it behind the boat, a fake seal, so that the sharks will come up and grab at it and they can get nice videos. So they're like fly fishing for great white sharks. The other major shark group uh, is Squalomorpha. And these include a lot of cool fish like the saw shark there. Uh, dogfish shark, super common. Um, but also a bunch of other cool ones like frill sharks, cow sharks, sleeper sharks cookie cutter shark, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and an independently evolved massive planktivorous filter feeding shark called the basking shark. It's like a whale shark, but it's in a completely different group that split a long time ago. So it's convergent evolution of this super massive filter feeding um, planktivorous form of massive shark. And let's just watch this cool video of a basking shark foraging off the coast of Ireland. Uh, it's super cool because you can look, the, it just opens its mouth and uh, swims along, filtering the water onto its gills, and then it closes its mouth and washes the food off and swallows it. So the, the water's coming in the front, passing over the gills, they're filtering out uh, the zooplankton, uh, but the water is going out the gill arches on the back. Now you can see right through the gills in the back and out the mouth of the basking truck. A couple other cool sharks within the Squalomorpha group, the Megamouth, which uh, is a recently discovered shark, quite a deep shark with this massive, massive mouth. And my absolute favorite all time, which is the cookie cutter shark. Now that has a very specific name and you might wonder what the hell a cookie cutter shark would be like, but in fact, it has this incredible jaw structure here with this uh, really serrated lower, uh, lower jaw. And what it does is it will latch onto something and turn a circle, thereby cutting out a circular piece of flesh out of its prey. And here is a picture of a shark that has had another cookie cutter shark attach it, attached to it, turn a circle, and pull out a chunk of flesh for itself. And they're apparently relatively uh, undiscriminating because uh, there's a cookie cutter shark that attacked the acrylic dome of a, of a submarine. And you can just imagine the people inside the submarine going like, no, 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 no. I was on the coast of California at a place called Año Nuevo, looking at the elephant seals. And I saw this elephant seal here. And I said, oh, that's weird. What is going on there? And so I, I asked the folks around, I said, oh, that, that, that's cookie cutter sharks got that. And I was like, what? What, why, you know, why would the elephant seal just hang out and just be patient while a cookie cutter shark took one bite and then another bite and then another bite. So it turns out that that's not the way they work. They actually form a shoal 
in the water. And so something like a pre uh, predatory shark, uh, seal will swim down to attack one of these prey fish and all of a sudden they'll all turn on it and take almost simultaneous chunks out of the predator. So they sort of flip the script and all turn on the uh, elephant seal and take little chunks out of it really quickly before the elephant can seal can get away. Final group of chondrichthys that I want to talk about is the skates and rays. And these are fish that have been taken, and if this is your fish swimming at you, they're compressed like this. So they're flattened. And their pectoral fins are out on the side, and they move by undulations or oscillations of those pectoral fins. So they lie flat on the bottom. Uh, and you can see, you saw um, a bunch of them in the introductory video, including the um, cow ray and the stingray. And here are some other pictures here. Uh, they're usually on the bottom, but not always, because they also include an independently evolved massive filter feeding planktivore, which is the manta ray. And so you see in the upper left a, uh, a manta ray. In the lower left-hand corner there, you see a manta ray and a little head of a person below that. That happens to be my wife scuba diving off the coast of the Kona coast of Hawaii and they put lights down on the bottom at night which attract plankton and then the manta rays come and feed on that and you just sit on the bottom and watch them and they essentially do somersaults in the water over you and you can take pictures of them while they do so. Uh, this is during the day but manta rays have been taught, attracted to an area that has a high concentration of plankton and they basically just do little somersaults uh, within this column of plankton so they can retain, they can stay within that really uh, narrow area of um, of plankton, that highly concentrated area of plankton. But otherwise, it works like a basking shark or a uh, whale shark. So you have convergent evolution of this massive filter feeding planktivore in each of these three chondrichthys groups.